Um, uh, welcome to uh, the latest um, visiting professor uh, for colorectal surgery. It's our pleasure and honor to uh, um, welcome Pat Silla uh, from uh, Mount Sinai in New York. Um, for those of you uh, who've been living under a rock, um, Pat um, uh, was born and brought up in the Ivory Coast um, and left uh, West Africa um, in her late teens, moving to the States, and became essentially an East Coasty person uh, ever since. Undergrad at um, Georgetown and uh, uh, medical school in Cornell, um, uh, before doing a residency also in New York and Columbia. She then did her uh, colorectal fellowship in Mount Sinai um, and went on and did. Um, probably a career-changing MIS fellowship in the uh, an MGH in Boston, where she linked up with uh, David Ratner, known to many people here, and began a, a program of research and in minimally invasive approach to um, endoluminal surgery and notes, um, and uh, which culminated through a series of studies in pigs and cadavers. Um, so that she performed the first uh, clinical TATIME for rectal cancer in 2009. Um, she has um, a vast array of publications and awards, Young Investigator Awards, um, and returned to Mount Sinai in 2015. Um, and currently um, is leading the U.S. trial uh, on TATIME. Um, there's nothing more timely than uh, this uh, lecture she's giving us today, so um, please uh, welcome Pat. Thank you for coming down to us. We're delighted to see you. It's a real honor to be here, obviously. Uh, I have a very, very strong ties with the group uh, here for many, many years, and all the work and effort has gone into developing this technique. And this is not the usual talk I can give here because it's such history with TATME from the start. So I wanted to kind of pick your brain a little bit, kind of give you some inside scoop that may not be so n known to people in terms of how you know, we've overcome a lot of obstacles you know, to get this procedure available to patients in the US and worldwide. So I'm going to give you a little bit of a different talk about you know, things that we found out, things that are not so true out there, and then put it sort of, uh, so, sort of together. So these are my financial disclosures, which to some, to some degree relate to, uh, to obviously the, the content, but not the topic. I will not go into the technique of TATME. This is really not relevant. And I do have to admit, I do have a frank obsession, and my husband is fully aware, as in my family, with transcendental surgery. Uh, and really, this goes back from my colorectal fellowship at Mount Sinai, where Alex Kim introduced me to a TEM. We were very lucky to have the, uh, the uh, Richard Wolf platform available. Um, and I trained as a fellow, and that obsession really um, has never stopped. Um, yeah. So you obviously know TATME now has become mainstream pretty much around the world. Um, so, I mean, you literally cannot read a paper about rectal cancer or go to a talk about rectal cancer without hearing about transcendental TME. And, you know, worldwide, it's really catched on quite a bit. We're over 9, 10,000 cases worldwide. We can't even keep up. Lots of publications, lots of data, which really makes things quite interesting now. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, you know, when you look at that data, what you should keep in mind um, looking at those studies. So. Myth number one, TATME came from Tata and ISR. I have the fullest amount of respect for John Marks, Gerald Marks, uh, Eric Rullier, the entire groups, and including uh, a lot of Japanese surgeons who've really developed ISR over the last 15, 15 years. But I'll be quite honest, uh, when you see those nice slides showing the evolution of transcendental TME, and you see the nice slide of ISR, and then next thing you know, you push in, and then here is TATME, really the natural evolution of, T of, uh, of Tata. That is not true. Um, you know, the, the true, true honest story is that TATME really evolved from transcolonic notes. It's important to remember, they really came from notes. It was pushed by notes. It was developed because of the notes era and what was happening uh, with notes. And that's really important to remember. So it really came from the efforts that were going on back in 2005 to 2007. So for those of you who were not really aware of notes back then, it was really an incredible, incredible time, probably one of the most exciting time in my young career. Um, we had heard about coldoscopy and the entry of the, into the peritoneal cavity from natural orifices. 
And we kind of heard vaguely about the work from Kalu at Hopkins and his group that had done the first in a pig um, a transgastric perinoscopy. And the idea was really quite um, um, hot at the time and, and really, really incredible. And next thing you know, uh, the group of India uh, essentially performed the first transgastric appendectomy. And this was back in 2006. So this was happening, and a lot of us didn't even realize this was happening because this really didn't fall under colorectal whatsoever. But this was really quite exciting, and a lot of people started taking notice, leaders around um, in, in the country and abroad, and started to work uh, on developing this model, the model of really entering an abdominal cavity, preferentially the stomach, because these were gastrointestinal surgeons, MIS surgeons, foregut surgeons, and really pushing the boundaries, just using simple colonoscopes and snares and forceps and really trying to do that work in animals, okay? not in humans, um, but very carefully pro uh, careful process that really led to the birth of no scar and then really this, this work in the experimental model. So to give you a little of the land back in 2006, 2007, a lot of that work was really, again, experimental. The only transcolonic work that was, that was happening around the time was exploration of the abdomen, the idea of entering the abdomen through the colon. Uh, people were looking at maybe doing cholecystectomy that way. Obviously, this was not led by colorectal surgeons, okay? These were uh, uh, really forward thinkers in the lab uh, using transvaginal, transcolonic, and transgastric access. Uh, so we were really not in the picture quite yet. And we really were not in the picture until Mark Whiteford and Lee Swamstrom uh, came into the picture. That was back in 2007. So here I come from New York. Um, I, this is literally my first month. At MGH, Dr. Ratner, who's my fellowship director, says, hey, you, can, you should really come uh, to a NOSCAR uh, meeting in Boston. And I walked in during uh, a break uh, from, from, from cases, and I just walked in. I had never met any of those people. I was still, you know, as, as many of the fellows, you know, pretty new to the, to the area. And I'm seeing this video. I walked in, I see Mark Whiteford at the podium showing this video in a human cadaver performing essentially the first notes, uh, transcolonic, um, rectal sigmoidectomy in uh, cadavers, and he was presenting a series of three cadavers. And me and my obsession with TM, um, I just completely looked at this and I leaned over to Dr. Ratner and I said, I want to do this, A, and B, this is the future of colorectal surgery. And obviously he was like, you're insane, but sure, no problem, you can use my lab and do what you want to do. And he had a fully staffed lab and they were working on transgastric and transvaginal work, as well as transesophageal work uh, that eventually led to things like POEM. Um, but I was very fortunate to be able to, uh, you know, look at this, be inspired by it, and then have the, the, uh, the ability to go to the lab and start working on that approach. But this really was the first uh, uh, a demonstration of actually using the transcolonic, transrectal route primarily to do a colorectal procedure, okay? Not to extend something, not to extend Tata. It was really, we're going to make a hole through the colon, dissect the colon, get into the perineal cavity, and do a colorectal resection. First demonstration in 2007. So Mark was very lucky because he was working with Lee Swamstrand, who's, who's literally one of the most, the smartest, most forward-thinking innovator um, that we've had. And, and so this was really uh, uh, the combination of that work and that thinking, and, and Mark being a colorectal surgeon, obviously being very focused on uh, colorectal application. So we went back to the lab back in 2008 and sort of working back from the pigs and, and, and really pushing this, this approach. This, as um, John mentioned, led to a lot of work and a lot of cadavers being sacrificed. I can tell you lots of, of cadavers from pigs first and then eventually survival model. And this is David Ratner at one of our lab meetings. Um, and this was really an exhilarating time because I was still a fellow, but I was able to uh, carve out some time, some research time, and even got a, a no-score grant to do some of that work early. Um, uh, so this was a, good, a, a great time. So then we moved on to survival. The idea was, okay, we've developed and standardized the approach in pigs uh, using a, a commercially available platform, and that was a key. It was commercially availability of those platforms. So we were not tied to, to device development. We had those platforms readily available to do the work. And then we were obviously using also transgastric assistance, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. So the, the animal work was proceeding very nicely. We had a cadaver series, then moved on to survival model, showed that the animals were doing okay. We were able to extract longer and longer segments of the rectosigmoid using transgastric assistant. And this is important to remember because, again, the, 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 the goal was to perform notes. It was not to be limited to the, just the rectum. We really wanted to be able to do entire colorectal resections using only a natural orifices, so the anus and the stomach. Um, so this was really pure, pure notes. Again, th that was the objective. And you can see here in these early videos, we were not limited. We didn't want to be limited to the rectum, okay? So this is with my colleagues, uh, Song Young Kim, 
uh, from Seoul, who actually was a master endoscopist and ESD surgeon already. And he was doing all the um, uh, transgastric work. And it was really spectacular. I mean, I'd be working transanally using uh, some of the prototype instruments that were being developed, uh, flexible tip 45, 65 centimeter uh, flexible instruments through the TM platform to try to reach the splenic flexure. And meanwhile, he would take a scope and just a simple needle knife, and he would go through the stomach and essentially help me and would beat at the splenic flexure to do the splenic flexure takedown in cadavers. And the idea was, can we do total colectomies using a pure transanal and transgastric approach? And the answer was yes, if you're willing to spend 15 hours in the lab doing that, sure you can. Um, and so this really was proof of concept, how far can we go? You know, what tools do we need? We had a lot of interest from, from uh, companies developing notes devices at the time, so it was really an exciting time to see, you know, what, what does the future of, of, uh, of trans, transluminal endosurgery look like? What equipment do we need? Uh, where do we go with this? So we did a lot of cadavers. We did a series of over 32 cadavers. Um, and you can see here, the, the, the minority were the lap assistants. We, uh, lap, laparoscopy assisting this procedure was a failure, okay? These were the cases where we couldn't see, we couldn't reach, we couldn't do the full colectomy, or we're starting to have some holes because of the, you know, the, the too forceful uh, uh, grasping. But the goal was really ultimately a pure notes approach. But we realized this was not practical on a, on a, on a regular basis. This was really hard, took a long time. And you know, we had to kind of scale back and say, we can probably do it, but you know, to do a proper rectal sigmoid resection, which really we realized was the ultimate goal at this point, you, um, you had to be careful because the, the equipment was just not quite there yet. So another myth, um, the first European group to show interest in transdermal notes sigma resection was not Antonio Lacy, it was ERCAD. Um, I'm not even sure how this happened, but I think it's because I was very lucky to be nominated for a few sages, uh, an ERCAD fellowship. And around that same time, Jacques Maresco was actually doing so, a lot of collaborations with Lee Swamstrom. So next thing I know, I was invited to come and, and present some of the, the animal work we were doing in the lab. And, I mean, here I go, I'm like barely into practice, I'm three months, you know, as a fresh attending, among masters, showing them what I'm doing in pigs. I mean, it was out of this world, unreal. Um, but very, very important work, because I think it's finally when Antonio Lacy saw some of that work going on, a lot of people started to show interest. Sadly, these were not American surgeons. These were European surgeons who had been doing a lot of cutting edge things for a long, long time, who really started to look at this, especially under the influence of David Ratner, who was in those circles. And so it was a very influential uh, several meetings and work and collaborations that, that were able to expedite the process. Another myth that's dear to my heart, the first transcendental notes hybrid resection was performed by a 35 week pregnant lady surgeon. The answer is yes, I can't put it with a Spanish accent, but yes, ladies, that is true. Um, and um, the, 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 again, very, very lucky that through David Ratner was able to be introduced to um, Antonio Lacy. And then he called me up and he said, hey, guess what? I, um, I got IRB approval in my hospital to do the first transdental uh, notes. And you can imagine there was a dab to my heart because I'll show you how the process of getting IRB approval at uh, one of the Harvard institutions. And it took no less than 11 months. Uh, so when he was you know, able to get this in two months uh, across in Europe uh, was, was painful to hear, but exhilarating again. And so um, the fact that I was 35 weeks pregnant was not a deterrent. I look great in those pictures, but I can tell you doing this procedure was a lot less arduous than delivering a baby five weeks later. Um, this was easy because we had rehearsed the steps so many times. 34 cadavers and 50 plus pigs, let me tell you, there was no problem. Um, I think the most impressive part was Antonio Lacy, who had not practiced in the cadavers, um, to be able to pick up on this approach and, and really um, uh, learn uh, from even that one experience and be able to, um, uh, to continue the journey um, with this approach was, was really, to me, very impressive and a testament to his skill. Uh, so clearly this was a nerve wracking procedure for him because he had, again, he had the, didn't have the 34 cadavers, but it's really the, the, that collaboration, having done this so many times in cadavers and replicating the same steps, uh, really shows you that that kind of training, that kind of preparation was, was, was crucial to be able to, uh, to do these procedures. And the cadaver model, again, that demonstrated to us that the cadaver model, the training model would be a successful one. Um, and that collaboration between surgeons would be very successful. So here's Jonah, uh, Jonah is my firstborn. And so I was enjoying um, the process, a couple of weeks later delivering and then writing the paper that was on my, my top list after delivering and this was going really well. And guess what? I get a nice uh, email from the head of the IRB um, at Harvard, Lily uh, Homan, if you ever meet her, she's a very scary lady. 
I don't, scare, I, won't, I don't get scared very easily, but she really scared the crap out of me. And this is the formalized uh, email that I got, uh, followed by a phone call. Uh, it's come to my attention that you have traveled to Spain recently to perform a nose procedure with a colleague there. Um, uh, you did not get approval to do a nose procedure in Spain. And uh, IRB policy at uh, MGH and affiliates is really, you should have had that taken care of under IRB approval. And so our response was shock. It's like, really? Because this was taken care of by Dr. Lacey. Lacey had IRB approval. I was on there. I had malpractice insurance was covered. Everything was taken care of. But no, no, we violated policy. And so that was a bit of, a, of an issue that we had to deal with. Fortunately, with uh, uh, Andrew Warshaw, who was at the, the chair at the time, and David Ratner, we were able to dodge that bullet. And um, it got a little ugly. You know, in some of the communications, I kept them because I felt they were just, you know, this is Andrew Warshaw. And... Um, he doesn't get rattled easily, Dr. Dr. Warshaw. Uh, we were unaware of MGH IRB regulation and any clinical research activity, no matter where in the world, requires MGH IRB approval. My interpretation on what you're saying is that this applies not only to my to clinical research conducted by an MGH staff member, but any contact, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. Oops. But eventually, uh, we um, you know, admitted that we were not familiar with the policy, that we would endorse it and, and respect it in the future. And we had to, you know, the, the process was formal to present it, uh, at the IRB the Spanish protocol translated in English and then retroactively get my involvement approved. But this blocked all further um, 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 uh, collaboration with Dr. Lacey at that particular time, I was forbidden to go back, although he had invited me already several times to do additional cases. That, that put a stop to our collaboration for a little bit. So another myth, early TATM experience centers performed initial cases under IRB protocols, just like this one. What do you think this one is? Yes? No, absolutely not. Um, so this is what we had in mind. This was the same model that was used for POEM, uh, per oral endoscopic myotomy. And this is the, 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 the path that, that no scar had outlined and that we really felt we had to follow from proof of concept to preclinical to clinical application under IRB phase one approval. But this is what the stakes, the stakes were high. The stakes was how do you go from a pig model, which is totally useless when you talk about cancer, to cadaver, which is pretty good, but still, you can't really deal, think of dealing with cancer without, you know, some type of um, IRB institutional uh, supervision and approval of procedures, but you'd be surprised. So we went through hell to get it. As I mentioned, we drafted a very simple five patient, you know, no node positive, all T1, 2, 3, uh, no T4s, no previous pelvic surgery. I mean, we were as kosher, as we say in New York, as you can imagine. And despite this, it took literally 10 months to get approval. Five, six rounds of, of back and forth amendments, uh, safety, safety metrics in place. So we're finally ready to go at MGH um, and only in March 2011. But what was happening in the literature around the time that we published this one first case report with Lacey was several people, including actually I got a call, call from uh, Professor Chen, who said, I just did one. I looked at your video and I did one. Yay. And so this was happening uh, around the world. People were just essentially using custom-made platforms uh, in, uh, in China and in other places. People were scrambling using colonoscopes and other types of devices that were just starting to emerge. Um, and so, you know, this we looked at this uh, with trepidation because we were worried. I mean, we knew how much training we had to, 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 to do uh, to feel ready to do this in cancers, but you had, but these people are not anybody. I mean, these were world expert uh, rectal cancer surgeons, so that was reassuring, but still a little bit nerve wracking. So I wanna say that I think probably the biggest step in implementation of TATME um, was single-handedly the introduction of single incision platforms, no doubt. And I think when the credit really goes to Sam and, um, and Matt, um, and yes, this is probably one of my favorite pictures because I mean, Matt, Matt, ass man, Matt, um, because without their endorsing and developing all those transnational platforms, we wouldn't be where we are that fast. I mean, the fact that we were able to progress to clinical applications so rapidly was because of those platforms and they really changed the game because this is what Notes was dealing with. So when we were working with the commercially available TM platform, this is what was other colleagues working on transgastric and transvaginal access were working with, these really spectacular prototypes that essentially never made it to market, um, never worked for a number of reasons, the financial crash, the cost, the FDA insane requirement for, uh, for clinical trials, it was just not going to work. But we were very lucky, again, to have this 20 plus year old platform from Professor Boos that we could reinvent. Um, but it was really Matt and Sam and their forward thinking introducing the, the, the SILS platform and then eventually the, the gel point path. 
And then it was just a matter of time until you could see other companies developing other devices. And that was recently in China and Korea. And you can see uh, some of the creative commercial platforms being, uh, being really for very little money um, uh, being developed and, and commercialized to facilitate those procedures. And that really, really moved things forward very quickly. Concept of team training, the Europeans take a lot of credit for LabCo and training and proctoring, but to be honest, we were the first one to talk about training, okay? This is USA made. Um, so back in 2011, we described at MGH with our very first clinical case on IRB protocol, we actually took the team and, and, and brought them to the lab and did the first procedure, Dave Berger and Liliana Bordianu and Dave Ratner. We went through the steps with the anesthesiologist and the nurse. We went through it because we knew it was going to be a crowded space, very stressful for that very first case, and we wanted to be prepared. And so we, we showed that video back in 2011, um, and we're very excited about that process really working. This was a cadaver. We picked a female cadaver that would be about the same age as the very first patient. It was a 37 young woman with rectal cancer. And you can see, I mean, the tissues are very similar. The, 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 the technique was very similar. And that really reduced the stress of that first procedure. I just want to say one thing. TATIME came from a roundtable discussion back in July 2012. So the word TATIME was not random. This was a roundtable discussion that happened at NOSCAR where we were trying to align our terminology so that people knew what we were referring to. And that, that I'm really happy to see that it stuck around. So Lisa McLemore codified this whole training uh, pathway uh, in this really important publication uh, back in 2014. And uh, we're very happy to see that around the world, people really believed in this structured training. The, the, the first TATME training lab um, was sponsored by Richard Wolf. It was a very, very small lab with very key people in the US. Um, and unlike Matt and Sam, who were sort of doing it on, you know, kind of develop the technique on their own. Uh, a lot of other surgeons in the country really uh, uh, took some of those early critical labs and uh, developed their techniques and then uh, to eventually transition to a human application. But a lot of that work, as I said, uh, was, was really a US, in the US before it, it got exported. Um, we were very lucky to be able to have TME specimens. So the, the, the beautiful thing is that we could provide immediate feedback to surgeons about their technique by really carefully looking at the TME specimens. And I'll get into that when it comes to clinical trials, but this at least was a metric we could use uh, when talking about people. So a lot of countries started looking at this and we were really looking at the impact of training would have on adoption and it was really successful. And so this was the first paper that came sort of, you know, putting it together. We trained a group of highly trained surgeons, very motivated with a high chance of implementing the technique safely and you could achieve 70 to 90% adoption, uh, whether you're in the US or elsewhere. It's not without a learning curve and I think we're just starting to, 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 to understand the learning curve better now, but it's a lot of work, a lot of effort and still with some injuries. Okay, so this is really the training pathway that we worked on developing is not just the cadaver training, but the proctorship uh, we feel is really, really important. So another one, and this is another painful one, um, early adopters of TATME were not aware or prepared for the risk of urethral injury. Answer, absolutely correct. We had no idea. Okay, so when we were working on cadavers, uh, Mark Whiteford, I, and other people, we really started the dissection, the transitional TME dissection above the sphincter. We really never went through the exercise of doing it for lower. We never started doing intrasphincter resection and then extending the dissection as to replicate the model of a low tumor. We never did it. And so some of the injuries that we started to see with TATME, a lot of them were predictable. You'd say you wouldn't expect any different uh, uh, injury or risk profile with TATME, but some of them were very unusual. So urethral injury really kind of caught us by surprise. We were not prepared for that one. And I can speak very personally. This is a very personal uh, matter. Um, I was doing my, uh, this was my fourth uh, TATME case in a male at MGH. And this was December 3rd, 2012. I had a prominent Italian surgeon in the room watching closely and actually recording parts of it with his phone. And my same team, Dr. Berger and Dr. Liliana Bordianu, and we're doing the case. And it was a tough case. I mean, this was a young guy with previous meds who already had a liver uh, resection and had uh, the full dose chemo radiation, seven weeks post chemo radiation. The tumor was very low. You can see here, Probably the critical mistake is, besides not knowing about urethral injury or the, um, you know, the, 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 the risks that can be associated with it, was we started the dissection at the dented line, so we're very, very low. We now tell people you should probably start with a lone star first and do your intrasphincter resection before you get into that plane because it's a very difficult plane, especially the radiated plane. You're in, in the plane between the, 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 the muscle. Uh, it can be very treacherous. 
Other mistake is you use bipolar energy, can be also very treacherous. You miss some of the planes. And you can see here, I missed the fact that I had already dropped the prostate right here. So here's the plane, is right here, the correct plane is right here. I'm completely misguided, the tissues are distorted. This is again another clue, this is a prostate, but no, I'm way up here and no one in the room saw it. We're all looking at the same screen, we all missed it. And next thing I know, I injured this urethra. And you can see on the video live, there's a pause of a probably five seconds where I literally, I don't think I ever felt this way in the OR before in my entire life. This was true horror. <laughs> There's no way to describe the horror of seeing this, especially having done all this preparation and realizing the implication of a urethral injury in a young male was devastating. So there's stages of grief. Um, we usually say five to seven stages and uh, I was in the denial and anger and bargaining phase for a long time. Um, and just a couple of months later, and, and this I shared with a, a few people who were doing TATME, but really never processed it. This publication came in DCR maybe three months later, and you think it make me feel better. Ha, look at them, the French, even the greatest French, they're having urethral injuries as well. It didn't make me feel better at all because, and I know Philippe Poinet very well, and we had a lot of talks about this. You know, his conclusion was, well, you know, these were high-risk tumors, you know. I mean, look, you know, uh, uh, CRM positive, T4s. This was not my fault, you know. This was, this was because of the patient. This was not my fault. So he attributed the injuries to um, selection, of course, and also the effect of the early learning curve. And I really wasn't satisfied with that. I really felt this is unacceptable. We should know better. Um, and so that, that didn't get me out of my funk, I'll tell you. So the one-day paper kept me in my depression, and then I decided uh, to, to spend two weeks with Eric Rullier in France, and because I felt I need to master ISR. I think the one piece in my training and my journey has been that I never really trained properly in ISR or TATA, so maybe I should go back one step and sort of really understand the perineal anatomy better to really understand. And it's after reviewing the video over and over, I reviewed it so many times actually, but that 2015 I actually put a podium presentation for ASCARS. Um, and that was really therapeutic uh, to really look at it and understand it and, and really kind of, uh, you know, just like you review the, the, the tape of a plane crash, understand the factors that led to it. And that was really helpful. Um, other uh, papers, um, uh, you know, started to trickling in and including a, a Sam Atala also. I mean, this was after 50 cases, Sam had a case of urethral injury. So this was really telling us something's happening and we, we need to talk about this um, before, before this catches up with us and our patients. And, and um, the last thing that really was on the way of acceptance and, and making amends is uh, we started a, a, a Urethral Injury International Collaborative, so encouraging other people to share their injuries and collecting videos and reports on the, how it happened and analyzing uh, it to try to learn from it and be able to pass it on to other people uh, doing TATME and talking about it. I think just recognition of that fact uh, was really helpful. The other thing that was really incredible to me was that we missed this completely. The fact that our urologist colleague had been doing perineal prostatectomy since 1904, and we're very familiar uh, with the concept of the rectal urethral muscle, uh, that muscle that we're sort of blissfully unaware of, um, that we cut during APRs that don't really define. And so going back to some of these original procedures was very helpful as well as part of that research project, and realizing that when they were essentially accessing the space between the rectum and the prostate to take the prostate out through the perineum, they were dividing the retroerythral muscle that they very elegantly described in many publications, many anatomical dissections. There's plenty of literature out there showing very elegantly that retroerythral muscle that essentially connects the urethra to the muscle fibers from the rectum. It needs to be divided to enter the space between the rectum and the prostate when you're that low down. Okay, so when you start at six centimeter or seven centimeter, your TATME, you're beyond, you're beyond, you're beyond the rectorethral muscle, you never see it. But when you're low, you will have to come across it. And unfortunately, most of us were not really aware. We knew it's, you know, muscular layer, we know about that, but we never really knew um, that he was there. And I'll show you another. So going back to original videos, we realized, oh yeah, that was a sort of like that thick, you know, you think it was rectal wall. We all felt it's probably just, you have to keep going because you're not through the rectal wall. But the truth is, this is different. Here it is. We've already gone through the rectal wall. There's another muscular layer right there. You see it on top, 12 o'clock. Look at this, what's this? That's not muscle wall layer. It's going straight up. That's not the rectal wall muscle. This is a rectal urethral muscle. And once you're done dividing it, you're prostate right there. And this is a, a really a critical landmark to get into that plane between the rectum and the prostate. 
And again, we're doing all these cases blissfully unaware of this. So that was an event. And then Sam and, and Matt and uh, John very elegantly demonstrated that uh, trainees were getting in trouble during the lab and after the lab. And so this, is, this was an issue that we knew we had to deal with. So some of the training pathway was being refined and is still being refined as we speak with thinking about proctorship. And especially for those low rectal tumors, having somebody else in the room uh, potentially who's gone into that trouble and has, has, under, you know, has had that injury, sharing that information. And uh, now you're starting to see more proctorship, proctorship networks popping up. Uh, this is a very exciting uh, initiative uh, in the UK uh, led by uh, Nader Francis. Uh, pilot training, essentially taking a select group of people who want to train in TTME, who obviously have the prerequisite skills, but really nurturing them um, and, um, and proctoring them and mentoring them in the process of their first um, cases. And uh, so far, based on my discussion with Nader, this is really paying off. And the surgeons who are training under that particular program um, um, would be great. And I would love societies to be able to endorse that kind of pilot training initiative, you know, select five people per year, you know, all expenses paid in terms of observer ob observership and uh, training and then mentorship, I think would be incredibly valuable. So another thing that is interesting, the risk of urethral injury is highest during early learning curve and less likely to occur to surgeons beyond the learning curve. We'd like to believe that, wouldn't we? Yes, we would. But you heard what happened to Sam. And Sam was quite humbled by it. I mean, he had done 50 cases before this happened. And so this is a publication that is still, uh, we're on our second round of revision. Uh, hopefully will be published soon. Um, but I'm just showing you the most important slide so you can see the majority of the injuries are happening, yes, during the early learning curve. So the first eight cases of surgeons is usually when they get in trouble. Uh, so when the ure urethral injury occurred, that's usually during that, that, that window. But unfortunately, you can see it scatters all through to case 97 to 104. <laughs> Sad, I know. Um, but this is not fake news, this is real. So clearly we think, we think, although we have no proof, it's impossible to prove, that one has to do more with learning curve and training and the other one has to do with selection. Like Juane, the Juane story. It was less about learning curve than about, you know, picking the wrong patient, really, when you know it's gonna be that hard, when you probably should be doing an exoneration for a T4 tumor with involvement of the prostate and you're trying to get that extra margin, that's where you're gonna get in trouble. We think, we can't prove it. So another one, and I, I think this one, I think I also um, want to emphasize, we're all very proud of the US phase two MCT trial, but like all trials, there's always a story behind it and I'd like to share. So the MCT trial was well received and well supported from the get-go, the answer is no. Um, it took four years to fund, um, we required a mixed source of funding, and we almost lost funding um, on several occasions. Um, and. I think it's also a testament and something I want to share with young investigators coming along to know that you really cannot give up uh, if you really have a good idea about a project and research and you really should be, and I strongly recommend you, you know, you remain resilient and persistent because it's never that easy. Um, so that's funny, it's like, okay, there you go. So just to give you a lay of the land, um, what was happening before we, started to think about this trial is this was a landscape in terms of TME. Of TME. Um, you know, already know this data. You know that back 2009 to 2015, um, clearly we knew we had room for improvement for TME, um, lots of incidents of incomplete TME and still dealing with issues with APR and, and too high of a rate and all these issues and including in a setting of randomized controlled trials, so trials being performed by the best surgeons in the world, still having suboptimal results. So incidents of incomplete TME reported up to 8%, probably higher. Um, positive CRM up to 12.1% uh, in the laparoscopic cohort in the US trial. So clearly room for improvement and, and a testament to how difficult those procedures are. And um, John and his group very elegantly also showed that this, you saw the data for the good centers, but around the country uh, in the US, you can see tremendous variations in the quality of TME and lots and lots of problems um, based on the volume of the centers and hence all that effort that's going into the concept of, of rectal cancers of, of excellence. But TME was very exciting and why people really got excited is because this was our first five patients. So after training and all the hard work came the reward and the reward was our TME quality was, was quite superb. Um, our margins were negative and patients did well. 
Um, and that data was starting to really get replicated around the world. So you can see all these series with 50 patients, or, uh, under 50 patients, the early data was really starting to look quite good. You know, TME quality uh, complete in almost nine, you know, 90, 98% complete or near complete rate. Really exciting, exciting results. So there was a registry underway and we knew the registry was going to be great. And then, but already people were starting about talking about um, doing randomized controlled trials. And a lot of us felt a little bit uneasy about randomizing patients that early on without any long-term oncologic data. We felt there's a lot going on, there's urethral injuries, and then there's this whole CRM thing, and we, we don't know for sure. So we really felt very uncomfortable jumping onto phase three. So we really wanted to take a step back in the US and say, let's just look at all our data by people who are doing what we're doing, who follow the same training pathway. We all train around the same time. Let's just do a simple, quick, 100 patient uh, phase two and, um, and look and, and make sure we're okay. And we were very lucky to be able to um, uh, get funding from the ESCRS Research Foundation. They actually committed $250,000 back in 2015, uh, which was tremendous and definitely unusual path. Um, but it was really uh, 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 supported and endorsed at that point. We knew, however, we had the challenge of raising $1.2 million in direct costs. So we turned to industry, and we also wanted to avoid the 35% overhead costs that would come from the, you know, paying off sites, which is a killer for most grants, as you know. So we were actually ask ASCARS or NOSCAR to be our administrating uh, sponsor, which they declined because of their bylaws. However, SAGES agreed to do it. So here we go, we are, got a 250 from ASCRS Research Foundation. We're so thankful and grateful and happy. We're starting to reach out to industry. Hey, help us fund this trial. This is really important for TATME and our patients. And we're starting to make a lot of progress. We had commitment by 2016, we had commitment for almost $800,000 from different companies where we're approaching others. Um, and here I got an email from um, ASCRS, and that was a year and a half after. The leadership had changed, the presidency had changed, and I was not aware, but according to the bylaws of the Research Foundation, apparently, all because this was old and that had been awarded a, more than a year before, this funding was under question again. And so I was told, I'm sorry, we have to look at this again and make sure that this valid to give you that money. It's like, oh, I didn't know that. I mean, NIH usually never pulls funds out, but yeah, that was interesting. And so I was put on hold for a little bit, and while this was actively going on, um, and I received also feedback from apparently they submitted the grant for review by one of the sponsors uh, that included industry, and they had some very interesting thing to say. They didn't feel that the trial was really worthwhile. They felt, well, why do you need to do a phase two when this phase three is going on? And by the time the phase three data comes out in 2020, your trial will be relevant. This was the feedback that I got a year after getting awarded, being told, no, we're going to take it away because your trial is no longer valid or useful. Or So that was, that, was, that was probably one of the most major setbacks I've ever had in research. So we didn't give up. Uh, I contacted all the PIs on the trial. I said, I just want to make sure it's not me driving the boat here. This is a group effort. This is, an in, this is a multi-center trial. And if we want to get this done in the US, we're going to have to roll up our sleeves and get it done. So every PI on that trial wrote a letter to the ASCRS Research Foundation to say why they felt this was so important to do this in the US. They all signed it. They were the most passionate letters you can imagine. Um, and we, we wrote and we fought. And luckily, especially with the help of several key people, including John, um, we were able to get this through. And we emphasized the fact that we didn't feel the color three really had Equipoise. We felt, you know, we felt uncomfortable randomizing patients to this procedure without having more data and oncologic uh, results. So, fortunately, yay, we got we got our um, our good news that we we won that battle and that ASCRS would honor their original commitment uh, to this trial. And in particular, I want to thank uh, Mark Stamos, Pat Roberts, and and Steve Wexner, uh, not only for helping move this through um, the um, ASCRS Research Foundation, but especially to help me bridge that funding and reach out to some of their very strong um, um, industry ties and to really help contribute to this trial. So this was a very, very uh, meaningful. Um, one more thing that I want to mention, uh, since we're on the topic of trial, is TME mesorectal grade report in clinical trials is really reliable. <laughs> yeah, you can believe those numbers, 98.8%, complete TME, absolutely. Um, so it is completely unreliable, um, and quality control is absolutely essential uh, for any clinical trial reporting. And this is so true for rectal cancer. CRM is one thing. I mean, every pathologist can agree what a CRM hopefully um, is uh, versus not. But for complete and near complete TME, and you see those numbers that are ridiculously good, 
Um, I think um, we have to be very careful when you look at that data uh, when it comes to complete and, and near complete. And the reason I'm asking is because even in the context of the US TATME phase two trial, we've learned a lot. We have a very thorough process. Uh, we have lead pathologists who are trained. Uh, so these are pathologists who do TME um, and process TME uh, specimens, but we made them uh, uh, follow, review the protocol one more time, so standardized protocol. Uh, we emphasize the importance of the, the how you cross section the specimen. Uh, we make sure they know how to take the photograph. So everything is codified and, and, and enforced. And we did emphasize, because for the TME trial, the quality of the TME, so complete, near complete versus incomplete is a primary endpoint, this was really important to be um, concordant. So we have blinded pathologists to review the pictures that are uploaded and then appreciate whether or not they, they match. They, you know, so they grade them, the pathologists at the site grade them, and then the blinded pathologists look at the picture and grade them too. And we're trying to achieve concordance. Concordance, complete, near complete. We'll take it. Complete, incomplete, that's a problem, which you do, wouldn't expect to see at centers of expertise, correct? Right? Wrong. So we've had a really, and this has been very, very interesting so far, what we've seen, and we, we almost at 50% of accrual, but what you can see is we started off with uh, the red line is the overscoring. So we started with a 50% overscoring by the sites. <laughs> and over time, we're very happy to see that actually we've able, we been able to um, bring it down. And I think part of the reason why you see um, a lot of overscoring is, again, you know, the, and this is something that we realize is the surgeon does a procedure, and then they take the specimen to the pathologist and go like, look, and they go like, oh, no, that's nothing. And then the pathologist hears it and is biased by it and potentially can impact the reading of the, of the specimen. And we've seen this time and again. And so it's required some feedback to say, separate the pathologist and the surgeon, do not communicate until the final pathology. You cannot influence your, your pathologist. It's really important. But this happens all the time. And so we had to kind of drill and, and provide feedback, and this is paying off. We're seeing better and better concordance between the um, site pathologist and the blind pathologist, so clearly the process is working, but don't take it for granted when you see this. And this is a classic example, um, really a learning experience for me as well, because I, I wasn't really uh, sure what we'd see. But here, this is a specimen. I mean, I don't want to bias you, but does it look complete to you? <laughs> no. There's exposed muscularis right above the purse string, right here, when probably the surgeon struggled to get into the right plane here. You can see it replicated on the, um, the arrow is all low, on the uh, cross section. So this was read by complete by the site pathologist, and two blood pathologists said, no, it's not complete. So luckily we were able to resolve it, so we resolve it and we get the pathologist on the line, we review the pictures together in a, in a blinded fashion, and then we come to an agreement. And luckily we've been able to come to an agreement in all those cases. But this is what happens um, in clinical research, and this is why it's so important when we review these papers to keep that in mind. Um, it, it's not always how you, it seems. So looking at local recurrence and distant recurrence and all these oncologic outcomes later, this is why it's so critical to do this under trial. Um, so. The Color 3 trial will not be completed in 2020, so I think we were onto something because they're struggling. They were supposed to enroll 1,098 subjects and randomize them two to one, and um, they have been really struggling. I just spoke to uh, one of the lead PIs yesterday, and they've only enrolled 121 patients since 2016. And the main reason for why is the surgeons really feel uncomfortable when they have a patient coming in with a tumor at four or five or six centimeters from the anal verge, a male, they don't want to randomize them to lap. They feel they'll do a better job with TATME. And same thing, when they have a tumor at 10 centimeters, the surgeons really don't feel comfortable doing TATME. They'd rather do a lap or robotic approach. So lots of problems enrolling. And the Grecor 11, which is a similar design a study in France, also a very low recruitment. And as opposed to our phase two, yes, we're sluggish. It takes a long time. We're very careful to select the sites that were already doing amazing work, sites that had trained around the same time as us. Sites, obviously Orlando was off its own curve, but they had obviously incredibly, you guys had incredibly experience, so that was easy to recruit um, uh, surgeons from there. But you can see we're very meticulous in picking the high volume surgeons who had already trained and um, clearly achieved excellence all the way since 2015 or earlier. And we added a few sites and we're doing okay. Um, we're cautious, uh, slow, the process is slow, but we're doing well. We have 11 sites now accruing actively and we're about to add Toronto. Um, so it will no longer be US, it'll be North American, sorry. But the, the Canadians are pretty awesome, <laughs> I have to say. Huge fan, huge fan. Um, so 
um, I want to end on this. There's no question the success of TATME, like any other novel procedure, I think it applies, is really based on closed multicenter and international collaborations. We're not done. This is not the end of the story for TATME. There's still a lot going on that we have to sort out. Um, I think the LORAC and ostrich registries are key to at least keep your finger on the pulse of what's happening and pick up early trends. Um, um, the LORAC and ostrich um, group have done an incredible job uh, reporting quickly and getting the message out there. Uh, they have a paper coming out on CO2 embolism. Um, it's same thing. They're on it. The data can get captured really quickly so that the message can be diffused early on what to do to prevent those complications. Same thing with the urethral injury paper. So this is really working, um, this constant talk and crosstalk. Uh, one trend that we pick up, for example, that was picked up by the registry was the rising incidence of anti-Semitic complications with TATME, something that was not seen in the original paper. That number is going up. And it really kind of allowed us to take a step back and say, what's happening here? It's technique, it's training. And we do know that the anastomosis uh, is difficult. It is a difficult part of the procedure. Um, and so that requires some finesse and some training. Um, also, the use of fluorescence could or could not have an impact on these anastomotic complications. So that opens the door to other trials, you know, and, and looking at this in a setting of the MCT trials and, and all that. So clearly, that kind of uh, quick turnover of data uh, without having to wait 10 years or, or something like that for a randomized you know, th clinical uh, phase 3 trial is really important. Finally, I want to give you the heads up. Um, the world is changing rapidly. China is joining in. Okay, so uh, Color3 has turned to China to help boost their numbers and have, are actively training them. Um, and they are on, on the rise. Uh, their numbers in terms of TATME, they claim is up to 786, and that was back in December. Um, they are growing fast and furious, and they're hungry. Um, and they are already aligned and trained to participate in Color 3 in several provinces. And um, Monier tells me the quality is good. So uh, that's something to definitely keep an eye on um, in terms of how they contribute to the bigger picture of TATME um, uh, in Chinese uh, patients. And I will end with this. This is really fresh off Twitter. Uh, this is why Twitter can be very helpful because this, was, this has not been published. Um, John, I'm sure you're familiar with this. This came on my radar about three weeks ago. This is probably our next big battle. Uh, as I said, TATM is not done. We still have a few battles to fight. This is one coming on. In Norway, they have essentially forbidden TATM. And it is because apparently the Ministry of Health has made a very strong statement, calls TATME an international scandal. And this is based on some of the audits that they've done on 156 patients who've undergone the procedure over the past two years at three or four different hospitals. And they found 10 patients with local recurrence, including two that died. We have no more details. We don't know who, where, what stage, what treatment, chemo radiation or not. We don't know. We don't know how those people trained. We don't know anything, but it's already making a lot of noise. And they've blocked um, TATME in Norway, and they're asking uh, for um, an audit and a, re a thorough review. So there's an investigation. The English is not very good, but you'll pick up on some of those code nerds. It was a surgery procedure cleared before being used in the relevant hospitals. Hospital oversight, IRB. Um, and is this could be part of a larger international scandal. The Europeans are squirmish right now. So our response is continue doing what we're doing with the phase two TME trial. Uh, I'm glad it's undergoing and going the way it's going because at least we'll have some data to back up what we're doing in the setting of a clinical trial. So thank you, Orlando, for continuing to enroll patients. And then I would also urge all the TATME centers to um, put their data together, especially beyond their learning curves. So when you've gone more than 40 to 50 cases, let's put our data together. We just started doing this at Sages. We put just uh, Kaiser Permanente with uh, Lisa McLemore and I just put our data together. Uh, looking at long-term um, oncologic data. It's limited. It's only two centers. We need more. We need to have a strong publication coming from U.S. sites uh, where we look at all our surgeons who've done more than 40 cases, what um, the long-term uh, oncologic outcome, whatever we have right now, uh, local recurrence and distant recurrence, because we're going to be under attack. If this Norway thing evolves. Um, this, there could be some really tough questions to answer. Um, and um, I think it's important, to, just like everything else we've done in notes uh, and TATME, to stay ahead of, of the crisis. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you will not be surprised to hear that uh, the Norwegian thing, which uh, I spoke to Roel about maybe eight weeks ago, uh, has politics involved in it, and it appears to be as much political as anything else. So I think yep. we just have to watch this space. 
the um, DCR paper um, on CO2 embolus mm. with an accompanying editorial uh, is in the next edition. Um, Fantastic. And the editorial came from the Mayo Clinic. Um, so that's kind of interesting. So what's your view about that um, CO2 embolus? At, uh, you know, the issue, Roll, as you know, Roll Humps from um, Amsterdam, who's one of the sort of named players in this field, um, is, uh, I think, even taller than you. So yes. Exactly. He's yeah. even younger than me, too, which um, is good. So Roll, yeah. of course, knows the answer to this because he normally knows the answer to everything. And I said to him, but I don't understand it because it, if it's just simple veins, then, you know, why does this not happen in other forms? And so, you know, I don't think we truly know the answer, but I worried that if this is a specific, totally unpredictable complication, it's going to be a nail in the coffin mm. because it's so unpredictable. Mm. Um, what's your stance on CO2 embolus? Yeah, so I mean, this is the one complication I haven't had, and I've had pretty much everything else, as you heard. Um, <clears throat> so I, I have to say I'm a little bit wary of these um, of these installation devices. I, I'll be honest, I really would like to see more work done on that um, because this hasn't happened in the setting of other commercially available platforms. It's only happened with one particular one. So I think it's going to be important to to do some studies to figure out pressure and, because I think there's something about this delivery of very high flow, high pressure CO2 in a very confined space that, that could potentially be over physiologic and overwhelming to the system. But I, I worry, I think the, the, the piece that you, I mean, th this is what you were supposed to do and that's exactly what you've done superbly. Um, so that paper will come out outlining some very clear uh, mechanism and, and strategies to prevent it. And I tell my anesthesiologist now before every case, like there's been cases, um, um, this is what it looks like, and this might happen, and I will tell you when, you know, I'm close to the prostate, and this, this might happen, and it's great. So they're aware. So at least I think awareness, just like for your injury, is key and being prepared. But short of that, I mean, I think we need more information. You know, is it, is it the flow? Is it, is, it, is it the pressure? Is it, I don't know. Yeah, I think it's very unclear. Um, we just have a couple of more minutes, so yep. that's going to stay and uh, do some uh, teaching with the... Uh, fellows, etc. But um, any burning questions? Can I just want to, I want to thank you for coming. Also, oh, thank you. I always enjoy hearing your talks, and I love the way that you weave the story of what you've done with this. There were three things that I think really stood out for the residents, perhaps who aren't focused on the THMP. One of which was your persistence. That yeah. Doing this type of thing, you're going to get knocked down, and you've got to get back up. Mm -hmm. Two. The ability to do this through your association with societies, whether it's SCARs, whether it's through stages, others, and how you form that network of people where you can collaborate. And then the third are the mentors yeah. who actually provided the opportunity for you to do this, whether it was from afar with Irkad and Jacques, or whether it was David Ratner or others with whom you've worked. And I think you wove a story about a specific procedure, but the lessons underneath mm -hmm. that can be applied so much. I love that you spent so much time and so many hours in the laboratory mm -hmm. really working it out before you jumped in and did it. And so the underpinning of all of these things that have allowed you to progress and actually make a major impact, I think is so important. And if, if you have any comment about how those aspects actually have allowed you to do what you've done so early in your career. Yeah, no, that's exactly what I like to talk to the residents about because, you know, a lot of people kind of jump the steps a little bit, but first you have to build credibility, and it comes down to the research. So once, you know, once you've mastered your craft and you, or you have the topic and you're starting to have publications and work that's come through and you're starting to really own your craft, I mean, people are going to, there's going to be a lot of demand, and to really progress the next steps, this is where your mentorship is going to be. But I always tell people, you got to have those backbone publications. You have to have those backbone grants. Like, this is how you build your, your CV. This is part A. I've done this, and I, I believe in it, and I want to go to step B. So that's really important. The, the mentors will come along. I mean, you're, you're lucky to have one really great mentor. Um, you, even luckier if you can get more uh, to support you. But people will believe in you because of what you've done or what you're, what you're, what you're working on. But you, you just can't give up because, I mean, I, I still remember the first talk Wexler invited me to give a talk on TATME, like the very beginning. Um, so, and this was like the video conference thing that he does. And a couple of surgeons made comments and it was, it was brutal. I mean, these were American surgeons who were really not kind and actually a little vicious, actually. 
uh, about the concept of TATME. Why would you do that? That's, that's, that's ridiculous. It makes no sense. And so you, you, you have to build a certain confidence <laughs> and a tough skin um, and, and really believe in yourself. But I think, this, I agree, I, you, you know, you have to surround yourself with people uh, and there's no shame in it. I mean, you have to surround with people who potentially can get you to the next level, but they have to believe in you. And so, you know, well, <laughs> they have to believe in what you're doing. There's very little new in this world uh, because I'm, um, as George would tell you, extremely old. Um, I presented um, uh, one of the initial series of laparoscopic colectomy at St. Mark's in 1993 and was subjected to mm. a barrage of criticism mm. and told no, in no uncertain terms that we should stop this. Um, it was clearly unethical um, and not safe. Yeah. Um, so it, it happens. We're going to move on, uh, and, and there will be plenty of options to speak yes. um, with Pat, because she's not gone anywhere. Um, and um, uh, so I just want to thank you thank again. Thank you. And, um, My pleasure. We will, um, in due course, give you a little um, trinket to take away with you. Oh, cool. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much again. Thank you. Uh, Appreciate that. Good luck with your meeting.